All right, so good morning. Thanks to everyone who has joined us today. Thank you all for tuning in to our press, to our um to my Facebook Live. As I said, we are talking about testing today. And we're just going to go through why it's important to test, um, who needs to be tested, and uh, so forth. Okay, so why is it important to test? A friend of mine messaged me or called me the other day and actually said that they didn't understand why we needed to do more testing. And this is not just a call from me, this is a call internationally that we need to do more testing, we need to do more testing, we need to do more testing. And the reason we need to do more testing is because, um, because this virus is relatively new and because we know that most people, most people, the vast majority of people who get COVID-19 or who are infected with SARS-CoV-2, the vast majority of those people, over 80% of those people are going to be fine. Um, they are going to have very mild or moderate symptoms. They are going to be able to stay at home and uh, you know, ride it out. They are going to do what Trinbegonians do, drink your bush tea, um, drink you know, your fever grass, your whatever, whatever, and be fine. Your zebra pip in bush rum and be fine. Most people are going to be fine um, after contracting this. And we're actually seeing data that shows that there are significant portions of people who are asymptomatic, meaning they have COVID-19, they have the SARS-CoV-2 inside of them, but they show no symptoms at all. So there are three levels there. We have the asymptomatic, meaning they are showing no symptoms at all. We have the pre-symptomatic people, meaning they are going to show symptoms, but they have not started showing symptoms yet. And that we have those who are mildly symptomatic, meaning they have very mild symptoms. They are showing signs and symptoms. They do have the cough. They do have the sore throat. They do have the, the, the shortness of breath and so forth. But it's very mild. And from those three categories of people, those people can still spread the virus. That is a fact. So that's 80%. Those people who don't need, well, it, it's not quite 80% when you really think about all of those people who are asymptomatic, but let's not go there. For the people who we have data on, for the people who are, uh, uh, have been tested and are uh, uh, showing symptoms, about 80% of those, more than 80% of those are fine, don't need to be hospitalized, don't need to be medically treated, okay? The other 20% of people who get it are the people who we are really, really concerned about because these are the people who get downright sick. These are the people who have uh, uh, moderate to severe, moderate to severe uh, uh, symptoms. And these are the people who you actually need to treat because they have very high fever. If you have a very high fever, continually have a very high fever, you can... Um, you can damage your organs and that kind of thing. These are the people who end up with shortness of breath and can't breathe and you need to have them intubated and so forth. So about 20% of those people need to go into the hospital. Of the 20% who need to go into the hospital, we know that about two to 5% and depending on where you are, depending on the situation, those people die. Now, for most situations, for most situations, if you have like a hundred people who are sick, it means that maybe only five people would die. If you start having larger numbers though, you would recognize that it means a larger proportion of the population would die. So if you have a thousand people, then 50 people would die. If you have 10,000 people, then you know, 500 people would die and uh, that is those are the the no, no uh, uh, if you have a thousand people 50 people and if you have 10,000 people about 500 those are the statistics that are out there and the reason we are telling people that you need to you need to test is because the, the we don't have a cure 
we don't have any medication because even the medications they are giving you is not medication for the virus. It's medication to help you with your symptoms. Um, and there is no vaccine. So you can't get injected with a vaccine, develop immunity to it, and then be fine. So right now, the only thing we are able to do, the only thing we are able to control really right now is to identify those who have it, to isolate those people from everyone else, and to help those people recover. So the first step is identifying who those people are. Because whether those people have um, mild, whether those people have no symptoms, whether they have mild symptoms, whether they have moderate, whether they have severe symptoms, those people can then infect other people. Those people can infect other people and the other people who they infect, so it may be a young person who has very mild symptoms, may then infect granny who has heart disease, diabetes, cancer. And then granny goes into the category of needs to be hospitalized and possibly dies. So because we are limited right now, because we are limited right now in what we can do and yes there are trials all over the world where there are people who are using different kinds of medication and we know for example that we know for example that hydro hydroxychloroquine is a medication that they are pushing in the united states but we are seeing for example where they are showing adverse effects to hydroxychloroquine um and there are other things that they are looking at. They are looking at whether people who have had COVID-19, whether those people, because they now have developed some level of immunity, which we are not quite sure about yet, but because they are thinking those people have developed some level of immunity, we can then take the plasma of those people and then take the plasma of those people and then put that information um, and then have that be and then have that be used for other people also that is something that is still being worked on that is something that is still being um thought of that is something that they are still working through so right now there is no officially approved medication for covid 19. And because of that, again, we need to protect that volume, that group of our population that is uh, high risk. And, you know, I think it was yesterday or day before yesterday, the Minister for Health in the, month, in the daily press briefings spoke about the fact that some Trinidad and Tobago has really high levels of what we call comorbidities non-communicable diseases. I'm sure all of you can think through. You know either yourself, a family member, or somebody who you know has diabetes, has heart disease, has um, high blood pressure, has any of those things. I am sure we can all identify at least one person who has one of these other diseases. And it is these other diseases that puts us more at risk for having severe uh, uh, symptoms or having very, uh, and because we are having severe symptoms, the risk of dying is very high for those groups of people. So we have those people who are older generally, and those people who have a severe sim those people who have comorbidities have severe symptoms. And because in Trinidad and Tobago, and particularly in Tobago, we have quite a bit of people with those comorbidities, we have to be almost 10 times more careful that we do not allow this thing to just spread wildly and go out of hand and get out of hand in Tobago. So that's why it is absolutely, absolutely critical for us to think through what works for us, what is absolutely necessary for us in Tobago. Because in some instances, what they do in Trinidad may not be the best for Tobago. And that is also something that we need to think about. What they do in Trinidad may not be the best for 
Tobago. And we need to ensure that the Tobago House of Assembly, that the TRHA, that those entities, when they function, do what is best for Tobago. Now, I will talk a little bit later about what they're doing in other islands and how they are doing it differently because they have identified that what is best for Barbados and Jamaica and so forth is actually different to what the World Health Organization is saying and so forth. But I'll talk about that a little bit later, right? So that is why it's important to test because we are still at the point where we don't know enough about the disease and we are at the point where our real only course of action is to test people, identify those who are positive and isolate those people, keep them away from the rest of the population who they can then infect. In Trinidad and Tobago, we have developed a policy so far of even those people who are not sick, meaning they don't have symptoms, they, they have mild symptoms or moderate symptoms, we are still keeping them in a facility that is not necessarily a hospital, but we are keeping them away from other people. So we are not letting them go home and ride it out. We are keeping them in what they call like step down facilities. And in Tobago, they've identified the um, the old hospital, they've done some refurbishment of the old hospital and are using that for those people who are positive but are well, okay? My understanding is that there is no one there now because if you recognize in Trinidad and Tobago, miraculously, we have had no, no, we had one positive yesterday or day before. But for the last couple of days, for the last week or so, we've had practically no tests one positive test in the last week or so. Honestly, to me, that is a teeny weeny bit um, puzzling to me. And in my mind, it shows what I've been saying all the time, which is I don't think we are testing enough. I don't think we are testing enough and we need to expand the testing because it is really, really hard for me to believe that the 20,000 people who came into the country the two weeks or so before we locked our borders. It is really hard for me to believe that none of those people have COVID-19. I mean, it's just one of those things that is mind boggling. I, I, it's hard for me to comprehend that God really is a Trini and a Tobagonian and we have been saved from this. That is hard for me to believe. Yes, I want it. I want that to be true, but it's very, very difficult for me to believe that. So I am still thinking that we are not getting positive results because we are not testing enough. We are not getting positive results because we are not testing enough. That is what I personally believe. So, it's important for us to be conscious of that fact. I know we have been thanking God and so forth, but you know, if you don't test, you're not gonna get a positive result. We need to expand our testing. So what does testing look like? What does testing mean? Um, right now, all over the world, there are two main types of tests that are happening for uh, SARS-CoV-2. That is uh, Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome Coronavirus 2. That's the name of the virus that causes COVID-19. Again, COVID-19 starts for Coronavirus Disease 2019 because that is when it was discovered. The two main types of tests that are happening right now are the tests that look for, you hear the minister talks about the PCR test. And PCR, tans, PCR stands for polymerase chain reaction. What does that test do? Now, granted, I am not a lab technician. That is not my expertise. So I am just kind of repeating what the little that I've, I know about lab testing and that particular test. What they do for that test is, well, at the lab, at CAFA, which is the only lab that does testing for Trinidad and Tobago still. 
Now, that's a whole different topic, and I'll talk about that later. The fact that it's still only half for doing testing for us. Um, what that lab, what they do is one, they first test to see if what there is is a virus. So you first test, is it a virus, is it not a virus? If the answer is yes, it is a virus, then they go and test for the RNA, the genetic material of the virus to say, okay, um, is this now SARS-CoV-2? Because they were able to, they were able to, to, to identify the genetic coding of the virus to be able to identify SARS-CoV-2 as opposed to another virus. So what they do, they do your throat swab, they either stick it down your nose because they are trying to get to the part of you where your nose kind of goes back into it's called it's called a laryngeal um no i can't remember the correct pronunciation but basically they stick it all the way into the back of your nose right kind of back here and then get material from there and then that material is then taken to be tested um what that does is the system multiplies, the system separates the genetic material, multiplies it, and then the machine picks up what is multiplied, okay? So when you're doing the PCR testing, when you're doing the PCR testing, what you're doing is looking for the genetic material of the virus to see if the virus is actually there. That is what you're looking for, the genetic material of the virus. Okay, so that's the one kind of test. That is what they're doing at CAFA. That is what they're doing at many other um, things. That, that the machine is a pretty expensive machine. The process is actually a pretty complicated technical process, um, but it's a process that they have been using for for other virus to, to, to test for other viruses before COVID came around. Um, so there's that. In some places in the United States, and I think in other countries, they've been able to do that kind of PCR testing rapidly. And what you would hear them talk about is what is known as a point of care test kit, a point of care test machine. And those are, they're little machines. They look, the shape is different, you know, depending on the, on the, um, on the manufacturer. But if you think of going to the health centers, and you have to test your blood, your blood sugar or your cholesterol. They bring out this little machine that you can test right there. It takes a little bit of your blood and so forth, and, and you get the result almost immediately. That is also done um, for HIV, but what they're looking for in HIV is a little different, which I'll talk about too. So with those point of care testing, it is still using the PCR technology but you get the results faster. Um, I don't know that we have any of those in Trinidad and Tobago. I don't know if we have any of those in the Caribbean, but I do know that they exist, at least in the US, because I've been seeing them talking about it in the US. And then the second category of testing that they do is what is known as antibody testing. And this is what they've been doing for HIV also, where Remember, our immune system works like this. If, our, if, our, if, if a foreign entity, a virus, any, gets into our bodies, our immune system is designed to identify it, to realize, okay, that thing is different, that thing is not us, that thing is foreign, that thing is probably trying to kill us, so let's do something about it. Your immune system kicks in, and says, okay, who is this? What is this? Where is it going? What's going on? And creates what are known as antibodies to fight against the virus. Um, same thing happens with HIV. So when you do the point of care testing for HIV, when you go in and you just take a little bit of your blood and within 10, 15 minutes, you get a result. What that machine is testing is for the antibodies of the HIV. And same thing can happen for um, SARS-CoV-2, where it tests, your body is tested to see if your body created antibodies for it, to see if your body created antibodies for it. Now, 
that your because we are still learning a little bit about we are still learning a lot about COVID nineteen. Your body can create antibodies for COVID nineteen, but we are not sure about how long those antibodies last and whether those antibodies will really protect you from getting COVID-19 again in the future. So how long your immunity is and whether it protects you, how long it protects you is something that we don't know about, we're not sure about. Um, and if you are testing for antibodies, what it may see, show is that you had the virus at some point, which does not necessarily mean that you have the virus right now. Again, because we are not, we are still learning a lot about the virus. We don't know that if you get it, if it means you get it forever, like with uh, um, HIV. Once you get HIV, it's in your body forever. It doesn't leave. Yes, you can take medication and suppress it and that kind of stuff, but it's still buried inside of your body. We don't know what is the situation as it relates to COVID-19. We don't know if that is indeed the case for COVID-19. So we will need a little bit more time with this virus to determine if, if you have antibodies, does that mean you still have it? We don't know. We don't know. And yes, I am seeing um, somebody saying that PAHO uh, certified labs in other Caribbean countries since February, and um, they've been doing different kinds of certification. And all of those are available on the PAHO website and you are right and i am actually going to talk a little bit about these other countries and what they've been doing because we would also recognize in trinidad and tobago that if you listen to the minister of health and if you listen to the um those daily press briefings you would have gotten the impression that CAFA in trinidad is testing for every other caribbean country maybe that is how it started but they are not testing for every other Caribbean country right now. There are several other Caribbean countries that are doing testing for themselves. So that's the second point I wanted to raise, the fact that there are these two main types of testing. The better test, the more accurate test, if it is done correctly and if all of the, you know, all of the protocols are, are followed, is the PCR testing and, um, the other one is the antibody testing, but again, we are not sure if antibody testing tells you whether you have the virus inside of you because we are not sure whether the virus lives inside of you after you have recovered from it. So those are the two main types of testing that are now available um, in the world and uh, different companies do different versions of them, but that's basically what is available. So that's the second thing I wanted to talk about, the types of tests that are available. The third thing I wanted to chat about is what, um, what was identified before, is really the fact that Trinidad and Tobago seems to be stuck with who can test. And I am sure you remember the minister saying very early that the only authorized the testing entity in Trinidad and Tobago is the Caribbean Public Health Agency lab, the CAFA lab. And he also said on many, many, many occasions that there are other private labs who are testing, but they seem to be getting inaccurate results. Meaning the results that you get from the private lab does not mesh with the results that we get from CAFA if those individuals are tested by CAFA again. He also went on to say that they are going to that they are going to expand who can do testing. Initially they said that they were going to bring in more PCR machines from wherever and they were going to expand to Eric Williams Medical Complex the lab there and to the Trinidad Public Health Lab. They also said a couple weeks ago, and I want us to remember this, eh? they said a couple weeks ago that there was a PCR machine, um, there was a PCR machine that is um, coming to Tobago that was available for Tobago and Tobago just needed to see, yes, 
we are ready for the PCR machine and we want the PCR machine. So yes, send it to us. I also did a live where I spoke about the fact that we seem to have turned that down. But from listening to the people in Tobago now, I recognize that that may have actually, they've changed their minds. They've sent people to be tested. They've sent people to be trained as in lab techs to use the machines and they are now ready or they are getting ready to do it. I don't know how soon that would be. And from hearing some of the underpinnings, you would recognize that it may not happen as quickly as we want it to happen. Um, but, you know, it is what it is. I want to highlight Jamaica and Barbados though, because those are two countries, those are two countries that are doing their own testing and within the last week or two has said, oh, we've opened up our second lab. So um, Jamaica just opened up a second lab. Barbados just opened a, a really fancy lab where they have a, a Cobus testing machine and they were showing all of the, the pictures of those um, machines and so forth. But what is critical to her, and, and this is also important, is that, is that PAHO, the Pan American Health Organization, which is the entity um, in this region that represents the World Health Organization, PAHO has been giving out testing kits to the various countries. And uh, for example, in um, Barbados, PAHO just gave them 11,000. 11,000 test kits. Because if you recognize our Minister for Health and the CMO and so forth, keep talking about the fact that um, there were questions about how many testing kits we have and whether it was sufficient and that kind of thing. And PAHO gave um, Barbados recently 11,000 test kits. Jamaica is boasting in a press, con a press release that they sent out um, within the last couple of days that they have over 20,000 test kits at their disposal because they've been getting them from PAHO and so forth. So we have to, we have to, to wonder um, how many test kits do we really, really have in Trinidad and Tobago? And why have we only been testing, because if you look at the number today, we've only been testing like a thousand, a thousand, let's say a thousand five hundred is how many people we've been testing in, we've tested in Trinidad and Tobago thus far. That is really, really um, distressing because we need to figure out why is it that these other countries, these other countries that have less resources that we do, why is it that they have that large volume of test kits that they are getting from PAHO? Is it that we got test kits from PAHO too? I am not sure. Is it that we refuse test kits from PAHO? I am also not sure. I'm seeing a comment here and I'm gonna share it with you that CAFO is currently testing, doing testing for, um, what is this, uh, St. Kitts and, what does SVG, I'm suddenly getting a blank. What does SVG stand for? St. Kitts and Nevis? No. Please put, um, put, Patricia, please put what SVG stands for. I'm totally blanking on that. Oh my goodness, this is what um, I guess old age does. So yes, CAFA is only doing testing for Trinidad and Tobago and for SVG. And uh, even they are going to expand and have, yes, St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Oh gosh, thank you. Thank you, my dear, St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Oh gosh, I guess this old age thing is catching up with me, St. Vincent and the Grandies. Thank you very much. So yes, so we recognize that those countries are actually, um, Barbados, Jamaica, and so forth are actually doing more testing. As a matter of fact, Barbados, I think, sent out a press release within the last couple of days saying that because they have had, um, because they think that the WHO case definition for COVID-19 is too limiting and CAFA has been using the WHO case definition 
for um, COVID-19, which is also very limited, that they think that they need to expand the, um, they need to expand their testing criteria because it was just too, too, too limiting. And let me explain what the WHO um, testing criteria are, which is what CAFA in Trinidad and Tobago is using. One, you have to have symptoms. You have to have symptoms. So automatically, that means anybody who is asymptomatic, meaning they don't have symptoms, will not be tested automatically. And we are seeing studies all over the place. Iceland is showing that 50% of the people who tested positive for them were asymptomatic. Um, when they tested that Navy ship, the US Navy ship that had a, an outbreak a couple of weeks ago, when they tested all of the, all of the officers on that ship, they recognize that a significant portion of those people who were positive did not have symptoms. And this is being replicated all over the world where they do testing. Also that cruise ship that they had, um, the, the, the um, Princess something cruise ship that was the, one of the first cruise ships where that uh, uh, was running around and nobody would accept it and that kind of thing. When they did those testing, testing of those passengers, they recognize that um, a lot of them were asymptomatic. So the fact that our first requirement for testing is symptoms means that automatically we are not going to test a lot of the people who need to be tested just because of that. Um, so that's, that's one part of it. It's also important to note that CAFA also had, well, one, travel history. So you had to be symptomatic and you had to have just come from a country that has COVID-19. Because we've closed our borders, that is no longer as important, but early up, that was important. And the other criteria is you needed to have had um, contact with somebody who was a confirmed case. Contact with somebody who was a confirmed case. So if you did not know that somebody was a confirmed case, they may have been asymptomatic. You got in contact with them, you got infected, and you showed up with flu-like symptoms. You would not have gotten tested because you either did not travel or you did not come into contact with a confirmed case. So you were not going to get tested at all. Or the other option was if you had to be hospitalized with some kind of respiratory illness and they couldn't figure out any other reason for your respiratory illness, then they would test you. But the thing with that is you needed to be so sick that you needed to be hospitalized. So we recognize that we are very, very early up for many, many, many weeks. We would not have caught many people with the virus because we were so because we were so limiting in who we are testing. Last week or the week before, the Ministry of Health says that they are expanding to do surveillance testing, which is what I've been calling for from the beginning. But their surveillance testing is also still very limiting because they are only doing surveillance testing of people who show up to health facilities with flu-like symptoms. And let me explain the difference between that and what I am recommending. Um, that again means that you have to have symptoms and you have to have gone to a health facility for them to test you. For them to pick you to randomly be tested. So even within the surveillance testing option, you are still limiting it to people with symptoms. And again, for all of the reasons I identified before, there are significant portions of people who are asymptomatic, but with it. This is what I am recommending. Um, what I am recommending is that one, at the base level, we test everyone who is showing flu-like symptoms who presents. So once you go to a health facility and you're showing the flu-like symptoms, which varies, including loss of smell, loss of taste, and these other things that they're finding out every day, they find out another symptom, you should get tested. Your contacts then need to get tested. So let's just say you, um, you have come into contact with your family, you have come into contact with other people, those people need to be tested. 
And that is the protocol that they're using in like Jamaica and so forth, other places. Whether you are showing symptoms or not, just because you have been in close contact with somebody who is um, who has COVID-19, you would be tested. And you could be, you could be tested multiple times just to make sure, just to make sure. And on the third level, what I am suggesting is that you do real surveillance testing, but not just limited to people who have uh, symptoms. You do random. So you randomly, of course, those of us who do statistics know that when we talk about randomly assigning people, we are not just talking about just walking and picking people. There are ways to strategically randomly decide who gets picked. But you randomly pick one in every 100, one in every 200 people to get tested. And I did the calculation for this because people would quickly say, but oh, say, that is so expensive. That is so expensive. We can't afford that. That is not true. Um, Kafa said a couple of weeks ago that their testing kits, their, their testing, the cost to test is about 250 US dollars. And I did the calculations for Tobago. And this is why I'm stressing on Tobago because Tobago needs to do what is best for Tobago. If we do one in every 100 people, remember Tobago only has 60,000 people. One in every 100 people in Tobago is a 600 test. If we do the calculation, 600 tests cost us about $1,050,000, $1,050,000. We in Tobago know that we have been spending money willy-nilly. I mean, we've been losing $10 million. We, last year, we spent 13 or 14, 12 or 13 million on jazz and all of that. We don't have jazz this year. So we could have diverted money that we were planning to spend on jazz, on testing. And that way we would have a better understanding of who has COVID-19 in Tobago. And we would then be able to, as I was saying at the beginning, where the aim is to test and isolate so that we identify very early who has it and we understand the spread. Later down, what I would recommend is that we do the antibody testing um, because even if we are doing the one in every 100, we still may not pick up everybody because we are not testing everybody. But we then roll out the antibody testing and we're hoping that within a couple months, the antibody testing would actually be very, um, the antibody testing would be very, would be cheaper to do. And we could actually do that rapidly and do it quickly. We could do it rapidly and do it quickly. So yes, um, it's important for us to recognize that those are the levels of testing that I am recommending. And particularly for the Tobago House of Assembly, who is responsible for Tobago? Eh? And we have been clamoring at the Tobago House of Assembly for more autonomy for Tobago. By the way, you realize that the whole autonomy discussion done, right? All you realize that, yeah. That is a segue. But yes, it is important for us here to make that decision in Tobago. And we could say we are going to spend our own money here. The THA has money that we would spend our own money to roll it out because it is what is best for Tobago. Also, you would recognize that every time somebody asked about money, because remember the government told us that they were going to the Heritage and Stabilization Fund to get monies. They told us that they were getting a loan from somewhere, I can't remember exactly where. They told us that we were getting, um, that we were, that they were getting, um, that they were getting uh, grants from other places and so forth. Because of that, because of that, um, they keep saying, whenever the question comes up about Tobago getting additional funding, they keep saying that Tobago needs to go to the Minister of Finance to ask for funding for ours, for ourselves. That is what they keep saying, that we need to go to the Minister of Finance to ask for money for ourselves. So that is something we can do too, because Trinidad has been going to the Minister of Finance and getting funding for all sorts of things. Given that we are only talking about a million dollars for doing that kind of ramped up testing, I think that that is not too much money to spend on um, thing. And I'm, I'm getting two comments here. Um, I'll share them. 
Did you notice that the test results from the 20, the 33 returning nationals who came in from Barbados, well, they got the results the next morning, which again says that Barbados is able to do testing very quickly. Barbados is able to do testing very quickly. And uh, the other comment says, um, I would like that explained if you can. I recall that they tested them just before they left Barbados too. And both of those comments shows that Barbados has ramped up their testing capacity so much that they can test and test very quickly. As a matter of fact, and I just wanted to confer with my notes, um, Barbados has stated in the press release, I think yesterday or the day before, that they can now do 300 tests within an eight hour period. They can do 300 tests within an eight hour period. That is the kind of capacity that Barbados has right now. They can do 300 tests in an eight hour period, um, which probably explains why those 33 people who were tested just before they came um, would get the results as quickly as they did. So we have to ask ourselves, we have to ask ourselves, what is happening in Jamaica and what is happening in Barbados and what is happening in all of those other islands that's allowing them to ramp up their testing so quickly, but it cannot happen here in Trinidad and Tobago. Honestly, I don't know the answer. I recognize I read an article, I think it was in The Guardian a couple of days ago, where they were saying, they were following up on the thing that, because remember the minister said recently that you can that they were allowing private labs, after they bashed the private labs like that, they were now allowing the private labs to do testing, but the private labs had to go through CAFA to get certified. Now, after the private labs um, pushed back, they then said, well, we didn't really mean certified because CAFA can't certify any of our private labs, but we just wanted the test validated to ensure that when the private labs do a test, the result is accurate. I have no problem with that. The news report, though, basically said that the private labs that they contacted basically said, this machine is really, really expensive, and with everybody home right now, uh, it's not worth it in terms of money. It's not worth it to invest in this machine and to invest in this technology right now. It's, 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 it's not worth it. It's not worth it. And that is what you know one set of them said. Another set who said they have reached out to both CAFA and the Ministry of Health, as was advised, to get authorization and, and confirmation and so forth to do the testing. They said that that process seems to be very, very up in the air, and they were not getting, res they were not getting responses quickly because they were basically saying, hey, I am interested, what do I need to do? And the answer to what do I need to do was not as forthcoming as it needed to be as quickly so they were still waiting they were still waiting and we also have to recognize which is something we need to think about that even the eric williams medical complex lab and the trinidad public health lab they say they were not going to do trinidad public health again they were going to do some other lab those other labs also have not come on the street and i am questioning what is happening why can't those even the government labs come on the stream and even the lab in tobago because remember we said very early up that we we needed to do the testing in Tobago for all of the I, all of the reasons I highlighted above. And Trinidad said we had the machine and we were going to give you the machine. All you needed to do was say yes, we have the resources. All you needed to do is say yes. And for some reason, all of that seems to be held up right now. That I don't understand why all of that is being held up right now. And those are questions we need to ask. Those are technical questions we need to ask. Those are questions we need to ask our leaders because you cannot tell us that yes, it can be done. Yes, it will be done. And several weeks later, we are seeing it's not being done, particularly when we are seeing in other countries with, in my mind, less resources than Trinidad and Tobago, getting it done and getting it done quickly. And to talk about resources, for example, in Jamaica, Jamaica has a mobile testing bus. So it's a bus that they've outfitted, they've retrofitted the bus. It has different partitions. So you don't have to go to them. They can come to you. They take the sample in the bus and they then take it back to the lab to get tested. 
that, my dear, is my idea of visionary thinking and visionary. And this was this isn't yesterday I'm talking about it. This is several weeks ago. This bus has been up and going. This bus has been up and going. And they now have all of these additional machines and these additional um, everything to do the testing. But we seem to be stuck. And that is the part I don't understand. Why are we in Tobago and in Trinidad stuck? Why do we only have, um, why do we only have a little over a thousand, let's say a thousand five tests done? when all of these other countries have thousands of test kits that they can do. I think if I'm not mistaken, I read that one of the reasons that Barbados, for example, was changing its testing um, requirements was because they had not gotten a positive test in a couple of days, in a week or so. And they knew that that just didn't make any sense. They knew that not having, understanding the, understanding the disease, that not having any positive tests within a, a week just did not make sense. So they then said, okay, we are not going to do what CAFA says to do or what WHO says to do. We have been, we are going to do further. We are going to expand our criteria. And because we are expanding our criteria, we are now going to do way more testing. And in the same thing, that is where they said that they can now do 300 tests per eight hour period and if they run that lab so that tells you if they run that lab 24 hours that's 300 by 3 900 tests within a 24 hour period if they run the lab 24 hours and they have the testing kits to do it because they have what did Barbie they say they, they, they just got 11,000 test kits from PAHO so they now have the capacity to ramp up that testing. I am really, really not sure what is our holdup. And Trinidad and Tobago, we need to ask very specific questions about our holdup. As it relates to Tobago specifically, I would like to ensure that we, um, I would like to ensure that we ask specifically in Tobago, because they've been telling us that they've sent a hundred and something samples. We need to know specifically how many of those samples have actually been tested and how many of those samples have been rejected. Because I'm getting a sense that we actually have quite a bit of rejected samples coming from Tobago. So even though we only have five positive tests, it is not five out of a hundred and something that we sent. It is five out of, I am not sure how many tests, how many samples were actually tested. That's another reason why we need to take full charge of this in Tobago and we need to roll out what we are doing here because remember the situation in Trinidad is very different. Huh? Trinidad is, uh, they are more spaced out. Of course, there are clusters of areas where the, the concentration is high, pop population concentration is high. But Tobago is only a hundred and what, 14, 116 square miles, 60,000 of us our level of interacting with each other is really really high our you know degrees of separation in tobago is 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 everybody knows each other and if you look at for example when you looked when they finally did the contact tracing map for tobago you recognize that even though we had the five cases and they were all in one area the lines to their primary and secondary contacts were basically island wide and this was only those people who have been tested because they follow the strict, strict, strict guidelines of um, what was happening of, of, of CAFA and WHO. I am convinced that we have more people in Tobago with COVID-19, but they have not been tested. I personally know, I personally know somebody who presented to the hospital with flu-like symptoms, and they were not tested because they didn't fit the criteria. And as I said before, there are other people who even fit the criteria. Samples were taken, but those samples were not tested. These are things we have to be conscious of, and these are things we have to treat with. These are things that we have to be clear about, because what we don't want to do, which I've been saying from the beginning, we don't want a situation where we relax our um, restrictions, we start moving around again more freely. We start interacting with each other more freely. 
and those who have it but were never tested or may not have even been showing signs and symptoms then pass it on to infect our grannies our mummies our aunts our uncles and those people who are most vulnerable who are most vulnerable so this is why we have to ask very hard questions in Tobago. We cannot just allow them to say, oh, well, we sent a hundred and something tests down and um, we sent a hundred tests down and we are just waiting, we only have five. No, we have to ask very, 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 very hard questions about what we are really, really doing here. Because if this gets out of hand in Tobago, it's going to be, it's going to be difficult. Uh, this did Barbados let me share this comment did Barbados get positive results after expanding their criteria so Barbados just expanded their criteria in terms of it or the, the press release came out um, maybe a day or two ago so I am not sure what has happened because it's been too soon for them to, to see what see um, any uptake just yet this was a, a, a thing a couple of days ago so I am not sure, but I, I, I envision. Now, the good thing about it is when we test more, we can then say for a fact we don't have it. But if we are not testing, we can't say for a fact we don't have it. We can say we, we don't think we have it or we hope we don't have it. So them expanding um, is going to give them greater assurance that when they open up, they, uh, when they lift these restrictions, that they are quote unquote safe to do it. Obviously, there are always going to be people who have it and don't get tested. Unless we pick up every single person and test every single person multiple times, we are going to miss people. But having only tested, let's say a thousand five people in over a million three in Trinidad and Tobago, that's absolutely absolutely not enough so if you have any other questions let me know um, I'm just going through my notes to ensure I did not miss anything so as I said before um, we spoke about why we needed to do the testing we spoke about the different kinds of testing that's available um, internationally not necessarily here in Trinidad and Tobago we spoke about the kind of testing that's happening in the, the testing um, facilities that are available in like Barbados and uh, Jamaica and the St. Vincent and the Grenadines also about to do their own testing and that kind of thing. And we spoke about again why the Tobago House of Assembly needs to really, really take control of, of this. Now this is a perfect example of us when, when, and this is a political statement. But one of the things that the PDP has been saying is that we need to redefine Tobago's independence within this unitary state known as Trinidad and Tobago. And what that means, and I think this COVID-19 thing has really, really shown us that we need to do a whole lot of work to ensure that even when we stay in this union known as Trinidad and Tobago, that Tobago is not so dependent on Trinidad. Because what we are seeing right now is that Tobago is wholly and solely dependent on Trinidad. If Trinidad cuts funding, if Trinidad cuts medical care, if Trinidad cuts any of those things, if Trinidad cuts food, we are going to suffer greatly. And Tobago needs to get back to the point, simply because we are an island all on our own that needs to do what we need to do to ensure we can survive on our own we need to get back to the point where even though we are part of this entity known as Trinidad and Tobago, Tobago needs to be able to generate our own economic, our own revenue. We need to be able to generate our own food. We need to be able to generate our own medical services. We need to be able to do all of these things because we are physically separated from Trinidad. And just in case something happens in Trinidad and they can't control what's going on there, we need to fix our business so that we can take care of ourselves. When we say redefining Tobago's independence, that is exactly what we're talking about. And this COVID-19 situation has forced us to think about how vulnerable we are in Tobago and how dependent we are 
on Trinidad for everything. So with that, if there are no other questions, I think I would end my live now. Again, thanks to everybody who um, participated. Thanks to everybody who shared. Thanks to everybody who gave comments. If there are additional questions, please feel free to send them to me privately. Um, you could send them to me within my inbox. You can um, post them on my Facebook page. You can contact me um, my number is out there. My number is published in the newspaper every week, 4948827. Um, so you can call me, you can message me, you can get in contact with me, and I would try to um, answer the question or help any way that I can. Okay, guys, so thank you so much for participating in this. Thank you so much for, for, for being a part of this. Thank you so much for um, sharing the live. Thank you so much for 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 interacting with me and we would all get through this together we will all weather the storm we would all be able to say hey we survived 2020 oh lord we survived 2020 right so that's why this is so critically and this is so important again thank you thank you thank you and have a blessed day